In a recent video, I showed some hostel rooms that we were staying at in Costa Rica, and one of my viewers commented that, wow, those are really nice and not at all what I was expecting from a hostel. Is a hostel not the thing that I'm picturing, where people are backpackers and using shared rooms and super cheap and not very fancy? Well, yes and no. There's things you need to know about what hostels are and how they vary throughout the world, so we're going to talk about that right after the bump. For a lot of my audience, you are looking at becoming expats, and many of you have done very little international travel. Some have not done any, some have done a lot, of course, but for many people who have either not traveled broadly internationally or have always done so with a rather Apple ample budget, you may never have looked at or considered using hostels. You've probably heard of them because of movies and it's just something that people are aware of that a lot of backpackers and kids when they're doing their gap year or trying to be on a super budget when they're traveling alone, a lot of single travelers will stay in them because you have these shared rooms and everybody stays together and it's a lot of camaraderie and of course, saves a lot of money in the era when rooms often in hotels would cost 40, 50, $60. It was not uncommon to find hostels for four to seven dollars. The amount that they cost is dramatically different in most cases. So they are popular with extreme budget travelers or those who are alone and just don't want to be completely lonely all the time. They are often designed as a place where you can meet people and hang out and sometimes have activities. But the definition of a hostel varies pretty dramatically from region to region. And if you're coming from the United States, nearly everyone assumes and believes that the definition of hostel means that it is a shared space where you rent a bed, not a room. And Presumably, other people will be in the room with, with you. It could be just two people per room, just like bunk beds or something like that. In some cases, it could be 30, 40 people to a, a room with a big space. You may have a single bathroom for the room that you have, or it may be a bathroom in like a hallway or a major bathroom facility with lots of different rooms that go and use it. All of these things are common and all of those are assumed to be how it works if you're coming from the United States to the point where if you look up in like Wikipedia or in dictionaries in English, they're basically gonna give this as a definition. However, to most of the world, hostel does not actually mean this. It may be common for hostels to have those amenities, but they are not the things that define something as a hostel or they are not unique in defining what something is as a hostel. And we have to just be honest and say, look, in every country, there are different definitions. In places like the United States, the definitions are mostly linguistic, but in much of the world, the definitions are legal and vary from country to country. And what I mean by that is that the country actually defines exactly what makes something a, a hostel what makes something a pensione, what makes something a hotel. There are rules that have to be followed in order to qualify for different categories. So if you stand up a new business where people are going to stay there and you want to call it something, that name needs to reflect what it legally is. You can't call something a hostel when it's really a hotel. You can't call it a hotel when it's really a hostel in most jurisdictions. So people know when they're staying at one of those things what they're getting, but the thing that they know is not that they're getting a shared room or not getting a shared room. Generally, shared rooms are allowed across all those things, just not popular in ones that aren't budget. But the things that matter more in most cases, remember, these are the commonalities, but there is no strict universal definition. In a hostel, you generally can assume that there's going to be shared spaces, but it is not a guarantee. It is just really, really common, but it is equally common, maybe more common that there will be private rooms like you would get in a motel or hotel. For most of the world, if you're in part of my American audience, you're probably familiar with the traditional motor lodge or motel. That kind of category of uh, traveling, low cost, no amenities type establishment is common in the United States. Those uh, motels or travel lodges are not common around the world. Most of the world has uh, facilities that provide food with your lodging. In the United States, when you're on the low end budget traveler spectrum, it is common not to provide food with your lodging. Americans are common to skip breakfast, for example. Why pay for that if it's not something you're going to use? So we have a lot of this, these motels that just have no amenities. It's just a place to check in, a place to sleep, get back in your car and go. But most of the world does not. So in a ideological sense, in the business ecosystem, the traveler ecosystem, hostels in most of the world replace motels in the United States. And this comes from a very obvious spot. Americans have a tendency to travel by car and to have their own cars. So the 
need to have food and other amenities at the motel is extremely low. As someone who's traveled extensively around the United States, I grew up there, using a motel is completely logical, and it never occurred to me that people would want breakfast with it. Why would you want to eat breakfast at a motel? Like, the room's not that nice. You certainly don't want food that came from that same place, right? Like, it just makes sense. But in much of the world, people are traveling by train, by bus, by plane, on foot, on bicycle, and not by car. And so when they stay at a place, they don't necessarily want to just jump in a car and go on to the next place. They are hanging out, exploring the area. It's just a different dynamic in the way that people travel between places that they stay. And because of this, having food at their establishment is generally pretty important. So both hostels and hotels almost always require that food be available, whether it is provided for you or in most cases in a hostel, they may offer food that you can buy, but in most cases, they're going to have a place where you can cook your own food. And in many jurisdictions, that is a legal requirement that they must provide facilities for you to store and cook your own food, basically a kitchenette. And so that is the thing that most people assume that they're going to get when you're a regular hostel traveler, you assume you're going to be able to cook your own food. But even that is not completely universal here in Nicaragua. I know of places that do not offer those facilities that are hostels, but they also offer, you know, very nice private air conditioned rooms that you would never associate with a hostel, but they do have a restaurant. You always have to have food when you're going to be a hostel or a hotel. There must be a way to eat. Now in Europe, they have additional categories like a pensione where they provide two meals, but not three. Like there's all kinds of nuances to this in different jurisdictions, but almost always around the world, a hostel is going to include some way for you to eat at very low cost. Now, if you're here in Nicaragua, for example, the uh, Hostel Paradiso in Laguna de Apoyo has a really extensive restaurant with it and very nice private rooms. Uh, the, the access to cook your own food, I've never even seen there. I don't know if they have it available, but they do have a restaurant and a bar and lots of private rooms and probably some shared rooms, but I've never seen those either. So the hostels really do vary quite a bit, but a hostel will always be generally pretty basic, very much in line with that motor lodge and motor hotel mentality from the United States. Here in Nicaragua, the mentality behind a hostel is a little bit different than it is in some places. If you're from the United States, you may be associating the concept of hostel with the longer phrase youth hostel. That is how Americans universally see hostels. I know no American who has not traveled extensively and overcome that mentality who doesn't think of it that way. And most of the world does associate hostels with younger people who are out traveling, not necessarily young. In the United States, we tend to associate it with people who are under 25, but in much of the world, we tend to associate much more like under 35. Uh, so that's something that's a little bit different. But in general, there's this youth hostel idea. You expect it to be young backpackers. The gap year thing is very strong, um, and they often do it to hang out together, often to be able to party together. Uh, but when you are um, here in Nicaragua, for example, hostels does not do not imply that in any way whatsoever. If you're a Nicaraguan, you're older, you're traveling to another town, you're very likely, if you don't have family to stay with, to stay in a hostel because they're more affordable. When your general income is lower and you're traveling out of necessity, you're going for a family event or so. It's not a vacation, but you're going somewhere because you you need to, then hostels are often what makes sense. But of course, they want private rooms, not shared rooms in most cases. So that kind of ecosystem filling uh, mechanism exists with the hostels. So you'd never get that, oh, a hostel, it must be kids going there. That is not something you would say here. Down in San Juan del Sur, we have some famous hostels that fit the youth hostel, party hostel mentality and, and exactly what you picture as them, right? Naked Tiger, Pachamamba, they're down there and, and they are absolutely quintessential what Americans picture as hostels. But up here in the north, in Leon, we have Bigfoot that very much does the same. But we have lots all over the country of hostels that are completely different. They target a quiet, uh, mature audience. They maybe don't have shared rooms. They do not have party facilities. They do not have a bar. They're really going after from a decor, from a location, from everything. It might be a place that you picture your parents or even grandparents staying at rather than your children staying at. So it's a completely different thing. That is the more common. As you just spend time in Nicaragua and much of the region, you will find that the tourist-based hostels, the backpacker hostels, while they certainly exist in the tourist areas, often don't exist outside of those areas. And it is the other type of hostel, this one that really just is low cost and conservative. It's there for people who are trying to not spend a lot of money because they're not trying to use their accommodations as a luxury thing. They're using it as a necessity to stay in a place where they're trying to do something. 
That's the norm. That's where hostels really are the bread and butter in this region. Here in Nicaragua and much of the region, hostels are actually the majority of accommodations, not a specialty one-off kind of thing. Where I grew up in western New York, I know there was one youth hostel located in Buffalo, a little ways away from where I grew up. I've never seen it. I know that my mom used it one time and I heard about it, right? They had shared rooms. It was meant for backpackers and kids. It was just used for some retreat thing that she was at, so that's why she was staying at it. But hostels were so uncommon that I never knew anyone in the United States who ever used one or even knew where one was. Like that's how rare they are. But here in Nicaragua, I can name easily 20 in Leon alone, go out to the beach, at least half the accommodations are hostels. Not all of them are uh, making a big deal. They don't put hostel necessarily in their name. But if you look at their official listings, hostel is part of their designation. Here in Nicaragua, the, the main tool that we use to, uh, to find um, uh, accommodations in the country, while most places are using things like booking.com, and certainly you can use that here, but mostly on booking, you're going to find hotels, more upmarket uh, options. If you want to see the larger variety of things, it is hostel world that really is used heavily here and you're going to find more accommodations and more variety of accommodations on there. In places like the United States, Hostel World doesn't have anywhere near that kind of market penetration, but here it is the leader because other tools have proven to just not be as useful, plus it has a lower overhead. So there's a lot of reasons why in a market like this it's going to uh, do really well. But that hostels are the main listings that most people are thinking about most of the time in Nicaragua. And there's many places that you can go in the country that hostels are the only type of accommodations available. There are many, many cities around Nicaragua that do not have a hotel but they might, many of them have nothing, but if they have only one thing, it is almost certainly going to be a hostel, not a hotel. Now, of course, if you're in San Juan del Sur, you can find hotels, no problem. Granada, hotels, no problem. Managua, hotels, no problem. And even here in Leon, not really a problem, but you start getting outside of those cities and hostels start to really become the dominant players. Almost everywhere has some amount of upscale market rooms, up market rooms, but there aren't that many. Hostels though, Lots and lots of room. So very different thing here. And the same, even in Costa Rica, in Honduras, and El Salvador, all these places nearby, all these countries in this region, hostels are the dominant players. When I go to Costa Rica, I routinely stay in hostels, unless I'm staying right by the airport. That's an exception. But anytime I'm staying in San Jose or around the country, hostels are the way to go. Saves a lot of money, and often they have really nice accommodations. The hostel setup also tends to be pretty flexible. So as an example of how this can work, you, the hostel that I like to use when I'm staying in San Jose, Costa Rica, which is very nice, we like it a lot, it has beautiful shared spaces. So if we want to hang out, like we bring food, sometimes we'll go to the grocery store. Remember, I like doing grocery shopping when I'm out and experimenting in a new place. So when I'm in Costa Rica, I like to go to the grocery store, bring some food home. I like going out to eat too, but like mix, do different things, like come and then there's a place to cook it, reheat it, store it if you're not going to eat it all because leftovers, that's like a real thing. And then there's a really nice common area with nice tables and stuff. So eating there is very comfortable. It's not like being in a regular U.S. hotel where basically you're going to eat in your room. Many hotels, I know they have common spaces, but they're uncomfortable in many uh, cases, especially if you're going to be eating in them. Like it's not something like you feel comfortable doing, but these spaces in hostels generally are designed to be very welcoming. It's what people do. They sit there, they eat, they hang out, they take their laptops, they, you know, play games with friends, like board games and stuff, read books. Like people actually use them. It's a social space. And as part of the hostel thing generally is that it's going to provide ways for people to be social, meet other travelers, meet the owners, uh, you know, talk to people because people are generally budget travelers. They need to be there. Um, they want to be a little bit more social. So hostels have a tendency to fill that pretty well. When we are at the hostel in Costa Rica that I mentioned, um, one of the things that is interesting about how hostels are often made. So we, instead of getting a standard private room, we get a small shared room. Remember I said shared rooms could be as little as one bunk bed, just two people in a room, but far more common is three or four beds. And that's what we do. We are a family of four. I've got my wife, I've got my two kids. So a room with three beds can be a shared room for three people, or it can be a single family accommodation with three beds. The three beds in a single room is super common in places like Nicaragua because families stay in single rooms, both often at home and when traveling, but especially when traveling. So you're gonna find this uh, configuration 
very commonly. But for a hostel that is able to do shared rooms, but able to also do private rooms, it means that room is convertible based on their reservations as to what they need. If they have a lot of individuals and they need to put people into more shared rooms, they make it a shared room for the night. And if they have families who want a single room with multiple people in it together as a unit, then a family can get that room. Um, in many cases, you just make those with a private bathroom and then it's completely a normal hotel room with three beds. Or in some places you have uh, shared bathrooms that are like in the hallway and, uh, uh, and then it's even more flexible, but a lot of people, especially Americans, don't want to use shared bathrooms. But getting used to shared bathrooms can be a thing, right? In lots and lots of hostels, you're going to have completely private bathrooms. It'll be in the listing, of course, but many also have shared ones and a lot have both. So look at this specific room that you're looking into. I still remember the very first time that we ever used a hostel. It was in Munich, Germany in 2012, and we were super surprised because we had never thought about using a hostel before that time. And we were in Munich, we couldn't find a hotel, and my wife found this place that was a hostel, and it gave us a private room that was big enough for my entire family, and we had all four of us at the time, even back in 2012, and we were really surprised by this giant private room that we had with really nice views in downtown Munich with three large beds in this big space. It was clear that it could be used as a shared space, but we got it as a private family room and it worked out perfectly for us and the place was very nice. Uh, we had a, a bar downstairs, a place to cook our food, all those things. And I went down and hung out with people and met people who were traveling. It was a lot of fun. And so that was our first experience with hostels and we learned right away that hostels weren't what we were expecting. And I think you'll find that they could be an important part of your travel too, whether you're looking to be on an extreme budget and hang out with people or you're looking for a slightly more flexible, less costly private space, just like anything else, just like the one that I showed recently in Costa Rica. It was a completely normal hotel room, not fancy, but absolutely perfect for normal travel. No reason to avoid it. Nice pool, nice restaurant, places to do everything, really great location, good price. Of course, it was still quite a bit more expensive than people picture as a hostel, because when you're doing private rooms, it's going to happen. But it was like $40, whereas a normal hotel would have been $80 to $90. So that's a pretty big savings while still getting the majority majority of a hotel experience. And of course, hostels are nice because just like a normal hotel, you expect you're generally going to have 24-7 uh, um, uh, support at the desk and you're going to have security and all those things just like any hotel would. And so if you're traveling, you're getting in late at night, hostels tend to be able to accommodate that in ways that Airbnb can be, not always, but can be problematic uh, simply because they don't have that infrastructure at a single building. Um, it, it, We've all, you know, if you've done Airbnb travel, which can be great, I do it a lot. It's what I did in Bolivia. It's what I did in Argentina. I use it commonly as I did that in Guatemala. But when you're getting in super late, you don't know when you're going to arrive. You just, sometimes it's a lot of logistic headaches and it's not always worth doing every time. And hostels will often fix that for people who are on that budget. So what are our takeaways on hostels? Well, the first main takeaway is reconsider avoiding them and thinking that they're off limits and not something for you. It doesn't matter who you are. Hostels might be right for you, whether you're looking for something that's going to save you some money or just the thing that's going to be a little bit more interesting, fun, social, whatever, it could be a good tool for you. So don't rule it out. Don't just assume that it's not going to be what you're looking for because it may easily be. And a great example, if you do want to see something that will kind of blow your mind, if you have this, you know, very limited picture of what a hostel is, that it's very run down, that it's very cheap, that it's just shared for backpackers, go check out the Selena Alhambra in Granada, Nicaragua. This is a super fancy hostel located right on the main plaza. It's one of the best locations to stay in the city and it has amazing views. It has amazing public spaces. A lot of its activities are super expensive. You actually have to be really careful staying there. While the rooms are not outrageous, they are high even for a hostel, but their restaurant, their bar space, their activities are all really, really expensive. And that brings us to activities. It is common, but again, not a guarantee for hostels to have activities, either organized as a hostel or providing uh, connections to and information about activities around. So really commonly, if you go to, for example, the Simple Beach Lodge in Las Penitas, you can go to the desk and they're going to have have direct ways to put you right onto the bus for uh, uh, Bigfoot or Volcano Day. Uh, volcano tours are going to be able to give you tours of the uh, the estuary and things around that. Uh, beach activities are going to have group activities, uh, whether it's party nights or game nights or sporting events or beach cleanup activities. All those things can be organized through the hotel. And then individual things where you're simply taking a tour with a tour company is arranged from there, pickups from there. Though often lots of hostels will work together and have inter or yeah inter uh, hostel activities on Friday nights. Via Via, the big, one of the big hostels right across the street from Bigfoot in downtown Leon, has a big hostel uh, trivia night on Mondays and, uh, sorry, and on Fridays they have live music that is really popular for the hostel crowd as, long, as well as the locals. 
And so they have big organized things. You can hang out with big groups from your hostel and, and go as a group and not feel like you have to go explore the city alone. Uh, so those things are very popular. Hostels are, tend to be like that. So our takeaways beyond you need to just consider using one is one, they tend to offer shared rooms, but they also tend to offer private. Neither is a guarantee in most of the world. So I'm gonna give you, you know, Nicaragua, you really don't know what you're gonna get. Just look at the listing. In most of the world, expect you probably have an offering of shared rooms. Private rooms are common. In Europe, I've never seen one that's only just shared rooms, but obviously they exist. Two, you should have some way to get food. Normally, it's a kitchenette where you can store and cook your own. It's not 100% guaranteed, but it's nearly guaranteed. But there should always be food. It's either that or a restaurant of some sort. The restaurant should be reasonably affordable, but it might be a little bit much. Uh, you're generally going to have a common space where you're able to hang out with other people. It's meant to be a social place. So whether it's just a dedicated little back area where you hang out or it's extensive facilities and big pools, they are all over the place. Some places uh, have really, really unique decorations and, and common spaces that are meant to be a draw, that they're actually like an attraction. And others, they're just in the middle of a city and they have enough space that you can get together with people uh, before you venture out into the city. It's a place to meet up with people who may want to go on. Uh, on the city with you as well, right? Um, and that they're going to be affordable. They're always budget conscious. So those are kind of the standard things that you expect and everything else is kind of an add-on that may happen. Uh, so uh, hopefully this has broadened your horizons a little bit about hostels and how to think of them, um, tools you may want to consider when you're traveling. Things like Hostel World will often allow you to travel more cost effectively and with a broader range of options. Uh, maybe not replacing what you use today as your, your accommodations tool, but uh, supplementing it with additional options uh, to look at. So for me, as an example, we tend to use booking.com, Airbnb, and uh, Hostel World as our selection of tools. In most cases, we're gonna find everything we need in those. And obviously when I'm staying at a Hampton, I use the app for that. I don't even need one of those tools. So we have lots of things that those pretty much cover the basis. We're able to find any type of accommodation in pretty much any location at whatever budget or, or specialty need we need at that particular time. Thanks for joining me. Remember, we do have this new membership thing that absolutely no pressure, but some people have signed up that Really awesome. Thank you guys uh, for joining. Kevin and Dale were the first two to sign up. So special thanks out to them. Um, we're going to be working on what all the membership includes and how we make it a cool program for you guys. Uh, but every time I'm going to say, like, if, if this is a financial hardship, please don't join the membership. This is just for people who really can and really want to be, you know, sponsors of the community. It is about sponsorship and helping making this happen. There's no, like, super ultra cool members only thing. Yeah, we're going to give you some stickers and emojis and badge, like, that stuff doesn't like, it's not worth anything. It's just fun, right? So we're going to try to make it fun. We're going to try to make it meaningful. But most importantly, it's just a mechanism for sponsoring the show. So if that's something you want to do, definitely consider it. It's new down there. So you know, uh, feel free to, to hit that button and, and join up. Uh, Beyond that, if you'd like to uh, hit that thumbs up and say like, uh, get down there in those comments, let us know what you are interested in, what questions you have, uh, things you'd like us to show, whatever. We love hearing from you guys. Send in videos that we can make into part of the show. That's always uh, very much appreciated. Uh, and as always, there'll be a link at the top. You can buy me a coffee to sponsor the show that way at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. comes directly to me. It's like Patreon. And we've got the cameras and the software, all the stuff that we have to do doing a show every day is is hard, but we love doing it. Thanks for joining me, and I will see all of you tomorrow.